welcome to Radio Who, What, Why. I'm Jeff Shackman. Back in the 1960s, Richard Nixon would talk and write a lot about the Middle East in general and about the Israeli situation specifically. And he talked about how it easily could become the flashpoint for the next world war. Certainly almost 60 years and many crises later, this is still true. Today, as a second and third generation still hears about settlements and a one and two state solution and peace plans are reconstituted over and over again, one wonders, do we even remember how this all got started? Does the original sin grow out of the post-World War II agreements of 1916? Or did something happen after Israel's success in the Six-Day War in 1967? Did Israel, to paraphrase our current president, get tired of winning? So one more time, we're going to go back and look at the past, the present, and the future of the Israeli enterprise. This time with my guest, Avraham Berg. Berg was once the speaker of the Israeli Knesset. He's a past leader of the World Zionist Federation and the Jewish Agency for Israel. He served in the Israeli labor government of Shimon Peres. And back in 2004, he retired from active involvement in politics. And it is my pleasure to welcome Avraham Berg to Radio Who, What, Why. Avraham, thanks so much for being here. Pleasure. Pleasure, Jeff. I want to talk a little bit about you personally because it very much ties to this story and, and what you write about it in days to come. Talk a little bit about why in 2004 you decided to retire from, from the political fray. I take it you mean why not earlier? <laughs> why at all? <laughs> um, um, I was many years in Israeli politics. Actually, you can say I was born into it since my father was one of the founding fathers of the state of Israel and a prominent leader there. And for many years, I saw it as my public, uh, um, public mission. And then one day, I mean, one day, uh, not literally, I woke up and I discovered that not only I'm hollow, but the Israeli politics has no direction. I mean, it's a great kingdom, but where's the prophecy? And I tried to look around and I, I got lost. So part of my, one of the reasons I retired from the Knesset because I wanted to contemplate, I wanted to sell. And the outcome of this thinking and contemplation is were five books already. And the last one of them is a one full of hope. Yes, no paradigms, yes, new directions, yes, alternative Israel, but with a lot of hope. And yet some would argue, looking at the situation today, that there's less hope, that the situation has metastasized in ways that, that don't seem to be curable. You know, we used to ask my mom, Mom, what are you? Are you an optimist or a pessimist? Or she said, me? Of course I'm an optimist. Today is much better than tomorrow. <laughs> so... <laughs> I don't share my mom's kind of optimism, but I would say as follows. On one hand, the old paradigm of liberal Zionism, of Ritzhak Rabin's two-state solution, um, Israeli, uh, Jewish, uh, privileged, uh, privileged uh, uh, reality is over. We are facing a much more severe situation when it comes to us and our past aspirations. On the other hand, it's a way, the wake-up call uh, uh, was called, and people wake up. People at the Palestinian side realize many of them, not all of them, but many of them realize that violence is not the solution. People at the Israeli side realize that occupation cannot continue forever. So there is a potential for a new discourse. And this, for this potential, I try to offer a couple of uh, alternatives. Talk a little bit about the sense of, and you, you touch on this a little bit, the sense of fatigue, that the reason this can't continue, the reason that you think something may change and that there's cause for hope, is that there's a sense of exhaustion from all of this. Yes, but this is not the only thing. You know, uh, you, you opened up in your uh, preamble with the 70s and Nixon, etc. Then the Middle East was... Literally speaking, the forefront of the Cold War and in influential zone between the communist uh, hemisphere and the Western, democ the, the Western democracies, um, etc. As for today, as hectic and burning and uh, chaotic as the Middle East is, it's marginal. Or at least our conflict, the Israeli-Palestinian mm -hmm. conflict, is not as central as it used to be. Iran is, ISIS is, Syria in a way still is. 
neo-Turkey and neo-Russia are coming back. Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not anymore the front fire. Being there at the side ease a little bit the tension, or I would say the burden off the shoulders of leadership and people, we can talk differently. And talking differently is something that you do not hear much, but I'll give you two examples. Um, I hear more and more in Ramallah and in Nablus and in Hebron, and I go there very often, people say, listen, it's not about territorial rights. We want to vote. One person, one vote. You are the only democracy in the Middle East. You want to vote. I hear it on the Palestinian side. On the Israeli side, I have four grandchildren. I mean, I have eight, but four of them are fluent in Arabic. They're going to bilingual kindergarten and bilingual school, and they know both languages, not just the verbal language, but the, I would say, the value and symbolic one. And these are, for me, indications that the new generation is ripe for change. But, of course, there are those from previous generations, and I suppose some in, even in the new generation, that will tell you that that, that kind of a one-state solution with everybody having the right to vote would mean the end of Israel as we know it. The Israel you knew is not there anymore. I mean, Israel of 48, that it's about oranges and equality, etc. we're not there anymore. Israel is a transformed reality. Like, by the way, North America is uh, going through a transformative period. But I'll say as follows, I'm not married to any solution. Whatever is agreed upon by a serious, substantial majority of both societies, I would say I go for it. As for now, uh, the formula or the rhetoric of the formula of the two-state solution is not a product with no expiration date. In a way, it expired. It is not there on the shelf forever. And the dilemma the Israelis and the Palestinians and the world community uh, are facing is not whether to have an empty, hollow two-state solution formula or something else. It is one government one state between the Jordan and the Mediterranean with two different regimes, one foot of privileges for the Jews and one short of privileges for the Palestinians. And I say, okay, if you prefer because of settlements, because of point of no return, because of fears and phobias, or even in, in, uh, a lack of capability at the Palestinian side, you want to go for one state solution, at least let's do it a fair good, decent one-state solution based on a very simple working assumption. Every individual between the Jordan and the Mediterranean has the right to have the same rights. That's all. So it is not between two-state solution and one-state solution, but between one-state solution with two regimes and one-state reality with a better regime. What you talk about in in days to come is a kind of two, it, it one state solution, but two state confederation. Talk a little <laughs> bit about that. Uh, you, you know, I wish I wish everything was simple. Like <laughs> one plus one gives you two, three, something. Okay, but never mind how you add the numbers in the middle. It's, it's never I'll get, It's never mathematical. It's never it's never scientific. So I ask myself, what are the components? What are the motivations around there? Are those people both sides, for them the territory is sacred, be it Jewish territorialists, be it Palestinian territorialists, are those for them security, are those for them sovereignty? I mean, there's so many motivations. It's not a, a clear-cut flaw. The ground floor is the one we stated already, every individual, constitutional one. Every individual between the Jordan and the Mediterranean has the right to have the same rights. The mezzanine is the one which says, here is the um, Jewish political entity called the State of Israel, in which most of the issues of the Jewish collective are being resolved. And next to it, fully, leaves the Palestinian entity, the Palestinian state, in which most of the Palestinian political and national issues are being dealt and resolved. And on top of it, the third floor, the roof, is a third confederative structure, which deals with, let's say, infrastructure, might be jointed, even value system. It's impossible to Jeff and a room live next to each other. For one, for me, you are a freedom fighter, 
I, I'm a freedom fighter, and for you, I'm a terrorist. It's no go. We need some kind of shared value language. So if you take the fifth laws, constitutional freedoms at the bottom, political definitions of the collective at the mezzanine, and in shared infrastructure at the top confederative structure, it might lead to a situation in which many will find a, um, 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 a solution for their aspirations. Territorial, sovereign, power, independence, still neighbors, uh, 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 and sharing together the shared space. And certainly as a political solution, everything that you're saying makes a great deal of sense. How does, what is the nexus, though, between that and the idea of Israel as a Zionist state? It's a little bit, if I may, um, a different discussion. It says that we, we, we are, we are how will I say it, we are so fully obsessed with definition that it doesn't let us look beyond the definition, beyond the paradigms. So I'll, I would like to start out of the box before I walk into the box, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm living in a space in which I love to see as much possible or as many possible shared spaces, be it roads and highways and hospitals and schools and infrastructure and even political sharing, geographical and others. For this, it means that the original ancient paradigm of division, dividing the land, separation, etc., should be replaced by a different one and this is sharing, which means from doing alone and secluding each other, it is moving into a more inclusive policy. Once I have this, I can revisit, and once we define or we build a better future for ourselves, or at least for our children, it will be easier to revisit the past. But if everything is about, let's fight about the past, who was right in 48, who was wrong in 29, who was bad in 73 or whatever it is, it will never let you off to move onwards. And I say, let's first deal with a better future. Once we have it, let's revisit the past. When I personally revisit the past, I say as follows, Zionism was a necessary movement to transform the Jewish people from exilic structure to a sovereign one. And it was a kind of scaffolding that enabled us to restructure and rebuild our political structure. In May 48, the restructuring was completed. We had a state, it succeeded. Zionism, at least in Israel and for Israelis, is not needed anymore. From 48 and on, I have a state, I have a society, I have a culture, I have a civil life, and it is it belongs to all the citizens of this place. And therefore, for me, Zionism was a fantastic success, successful story for the Jews, quite a tragic one for the Palestinians, both the Israeli citizens, 20% of them, and those who are living in outside of Israel. But nonetheless, from this moment and on, I move with the new reality. And the new reality is that I, who was born into the already existing state of Israel is a different political animal than my parents who were born before it. As simple as that. And I do not need the Zionist definition in order to define myself. It's succeeded. I can remove the scaffolding and enjoy the new house. What do you see in terms of the polarization that exists today? I mean, it exists everywhere in the world, and we see this rise of nationalism and, 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 and similar <coughs> trends everywhere we look. How does that play out in Israel today against the backdrop of what you're proposing and suggesting? Look, take everything you know, the populist movement, the uh, local supremacy versus xenophobia, um, Islamophobia, judophobia, immigrant phobia. Everything you know from here in America in the last couple of years, whatever you know in Europe, you have it in Israel, maybe a little bit even uh, more intensive because the echo box is smaller and the proximity of people to people is actually next door. Yes, we have it all. At the same time, there is a huge question hanging over the Jewish um, existence over there. And I'm trying to define this fellows. 
in our generation, uh, Jefferson of Rue's generation, 98% of the Jews are living in the democratic hemisphere. 24,000 Jews are living in Iran, 3,000 Jews in Morocco, two Jews are living in Afghanistan, I presume that they do not talk to each other, and that's it. All the rest of the Jews are living outside of any immediate threat for their individual or collective life. This is a situation that, at least in the West, and particularly in North America, raised an unbelievable question. For the first time in our history ever, can the Jewish people in the era of freedom, can these Jewish people survive without an external enemy? Give me war, give me program, God forbid, don't give me Holocaust, but I don't know what to do. Give me peace, give me tranquility, give me emancipation, give me equality, and I'm lost. And part of the issue that many Israelis are subconsciously are concerned is, if there will be peace the way Avrum describes here, and yes, there is no Iraqi threat, and there is no Egyptian threat, and there is no Jordanian one, not even a Palestinian one, and even the Iranian one is under control more or less when you listen to the experts. So we in Israel, the Jews, are going to face the question of the West, how to survive an era of peace. We don't have an answer for this. We don't have experience there. And this is part of the problem why so many people are reluctant to demolish the walls of the shtetl we built around us. Of course, the other part is that it is fed constantly by Israeli politicians who want to gin up that threat, who want to gin up the fear of, of Iran or anything else, simply because it serves their political interests. No doubt that fear is a fantastic political tool. I mean, listen to your presidential rhetoric, mm -hmm. listen to the hung Hungary from the Hungarians, listen to the, some of the uh, German supremacy in German and the neo-Nazis out there and the new Polish government. Fear is a fantastic tool. And especially in an era like ours with a fantastic acceleration, frightening acceleration of Mother Earth anger and technology speed up and the economy uh, uh, uncertainty, no doubt people are full of fears. No doubt about it, okay? Nonetheless, um, when it comes to the Jewish fear, which is also fed with our recent and not so recent history and histories, the grounds for it. I'm not a one to deny the existence of fear. I'm not a one to ignore the potential of threats, but I'm the one who does not want A, to surrender to it, and B, to exploit it cynically for political, uh, for political profit. I think that the role of leadership, any leadership, but especially uh, my people's leadership is to come with a platform of hope, maybe reluctant, maybe cautious, maybe very careful, but a platform of hope rather than a platform of fear and frightening. Do you find this change to be generational? It goes both ways. On one hand, um, one day, you and me will wake up into a, and our audiences will wake up into a world in which the last Nazi criminal and the last Holocaust survivor will pass away. And this will be a day in which the Holocaust will not be anymore a personal experience, but a kind of a collective memory. So this is a new day, no doubt that around the world, Jews and non-Jews are born, are distancing, historically speaking, uh, uh, chronologic, chronologically speaking, are moving away from the horrors of the Second World War. On the other hand, the fears of this generation are no less concrete. There's the class fears, nuclear fears, environmental fears, fundamentalist fears, even virtual fears. And therefore, I think that by the beginning of the day, it's a psychological, educational approach before it is a generational one. Do you trust or do you trust trauma? My nation for too many years, my country for too many years, got addicted or got, uh, is addicted to trauma. And I would like to replace it with trust, with a policy and strategy of trust. How do you think Israel goes about that? How does that begin to happen?
The good question, the good answer, which is very naive, is by persuasion. If I go from individual to individual, from school to school, from meeting to meeting, from interview to interview, myself and my friends and my colleagues, eventually it will accumulate into a kind of a positive avalanche. So this is the, the, the positive answer. The, the more realistic one is the Israeli society, you can say like maybe other societies, but for sure the Israeli society is very, is very uh, um, attentive to traumas. We use it to wait till the very last moment, and then there is no other option, but then we adapt what we had to do at day one. Only after 73 war did we make peace with Egypt, though it was on the table a couple of years already. Only after the first Gulf War, the, war, the Gulf War, did we go to Madrid. Only after the first Palestinian Intifada did we make Oslo. Could we make it earlier? The answer is yes. But the public opinion was not ready, and the leadership was reluctant, and people were mm, cowards. So the role today of people like myself and others who are intellectuals who are thinking and try to develop new paradigms is to prepare the tools and the content for the days to come. And then one day when the opportunity will uh, introduce itself, will offer itself, we shall be ready with paradigms and content to say, okay, you arrive the Israeli society, you arrive the Israeli leadership, here is the content. Adopt it, you have a policy, go for it. And in your view, how far away from that are we? Either around the corner or down the historic road. I have no clue. I have no clue. You know, when you ask me when I walk around the country and when I talk to people, be them um, Israelis, be them Palestinians, be them newcomers, be them people who were born in Israel, many, many people do not necessarily agree with me, but unlike 10, 15, 20 years ago, they're ready to listen because many surveys uh, indicate that 70% of the Israelis think that Israel goes the wrong direction. There is total total disagreement which wrong direction. But at least there is a feeling that we need a shift, that we have to have a kind of a U-turn away from the dangerous uh, direction we take now, be it the mass of corruption of the leaders, be it the, in, uh, be the passivity on the political front, be it the church and state tensions, be it whatever it is. I have a feeling that what you described earlier in our conversation is the fatigue. People are tired of the, of the fatigue anymore. Uh, people are tired of the fatigue. There is a readiness for activism. You see, every Saturday night in Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem, they have three different kinds of demonstrations, rallies, full of thousands of people against the malicious policy against the African uh, asylum seekers, against the personal corruption of the, of, the, of the prime minister, and against the occupation. It's not the same, it's not the same uh, demonstration and rally, but still, People all of a sudden go out of the street and say, we are up. So the readiness to listen is there. Avraham Berg, his new book is In Days to Come, A New Hope for Israel. Avraham, I thank you so much for spending time with us here on Radio Who, What, Why. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you. And thank you for listening and for joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.